I think so. And uh, yeah, and uh, today he will talk about uh, Open Hub, which is for home automation, and he will do some nice uh, demonstration. Okay. Well, we'll yeah. try to do something. Anyway, uh, good morning, Jan Pietmans, or JP, as many people call me. We, I would like to talk to you this morning about. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, for uh, for coming. I would like to talk to you about a little bit about home automation. Uh, who of you have experience with home automation? Good. With Open Hub or with different things? Fully homegrown. Okay. Um, you might want to change that. You might. Want to Although I never touch a running system. Um, so, what is home automation? What does it do? Well, basically, uh, home automation is all sorts of things. We can, what we can do is connect thermostats. We can uh, control lights. We can control. Uh, we can use sensors to uh, to automate particular things. For example, when the sun goes down, switch on the lights. We can control the blinds of the windows. We can do stuff with audio and video. Uh, there are people who like uh, when their doorbell is pressed that a photo of the person standing in front of the door is uh, transmitted to their uh, phone, etc. All those kind of things are, are basically home automation. Although I don't think there's a, there's a real sort of, uh, definition for it. Or if you use thermostats, you can set up th uh, seasonal preferences. For example, in the winter, you probably like it uh, relatively warm, whereas in the summer, you prefer it uh, slightly cool. We can use lights uh, and have present detectors, triggers to uh, switch on uh, or off uh, particular things depending on, um, uh, well, not time zone, but depending on time, uh, depending on daylight savings time, etc., etc., etc. Certain nice things we can do also in the area of home, home automation is uh, integrate calendars. For example, uh, during your absence, because you're on holiday, you would like to trigger red lights go on in the evening uh, to scare away thieves, etc. And many people say that uh, home automation uh, saves energy and saves cost. I am not a big believer in that. That's why I've stricken it through. Um, because all this stuff costs a hell of a lot of money, and so you get your return on investment uh, a lot of time is going to, uh, is going to pass. Um, be that as it may, um, home automation is certainly a question of uh, increasing comfort. Uh, and I'll, I think I'll uh, be able to show you uh, a couple of examples. Now, many people think that they go out and buy a little device. Uh, for example, this here is a Belkin, uh, what's it called? Belkin Wemo, I think it's called. Yeah. Beautiful little device. And you plug it into the wall. And then you have an app on your smartphone. And that app can switch on or off that device. Um, this, to my mind, is not home automation because this ends up being this, um, where you have a whole boatload of devices, each of them obviously with their own app. Each of these apps knows absolutely nothing about the other apps. Each of these apps knows absolutely nothing about the other devices. Um, now, what we see here is a whole set of things which are more or less interesting. We have the Wemo again on the top. You have your car, which has automation. You have your washing machine. If somebody can convince me why a washing machine needs intelligence, then please do come up to me later and tell me. Um, you, we have um, these uh, Z-Wave power sockets, which are absolutely great. The thermostats, for example, which are, which are nice. And each of these things, whether it's a lamp or Here's an, uh, I think that's a Philips Hue light bulb. Each of these things have their own apps, their own operating systems, their own, unfortunately, cloud services, uh, which sometimes mean that if that particular cloud service goes down, then you can't switch off the light anymore. Or if that particular uh, cloud service goes down, you can't change the uh, temperature in your home. And that, well, is not home automation. It's a collection of disparate apps which have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And um, this typically ends up, I've seen that many, many times, this typically ends up in, darling, would you switch on the light? And then somebody grabs for a phone and tries to find the appropriate app to switch on that one particular light. OK, so home automation should be something else. And home automation is, uh, um, is also 
uh, something that uh, where we need to be very security conscious and the Bundesamt für Sicherheit in the IT, the BSI, has issued warnings and this here is, a, is an excerpt of one of the last reports, I think, of last year, um, where uh, it was detected that, um, that uh, ovens, uh, steel burning ovens, weren't able to be shut down because they, they couldn't control them. Now, if you get to that, to my mind, if you get to that point in your home automation that you, re, that you rely on some foreign service to be able to shut off your lights or turn down your heating, then, to my mind, you have a huge problem. Uh, but that might be just So, why OpenHab? Well, OpenHab uh, stands for Open Home Automation Broker, and OpenHab, uh, you can mix and match hardware. OpenHab is a basis uh, with which you can connect different hardwares, different uh, devices, different types of devices, different classes, classes of devices, and control these via a central interface, via a central web interface, via a central app, with rules, with um, with all sorts of yeah stuff that you can use. You can mix, for example, do-it-yourself um, uh, electronics. You can add Z-Wave or Homematic. I've got I brought here with me a small example of Homematic. I'll show you in a moment. Um, OpenHab is extensible, so uh, even though a particular piece of hardware uh, may not be controllable today, it is very likely that either you or somebody else will be interested in making that piece of hardware available in OpenHab and will then add what is called a binding for OpenHab to be able to control that software. Um, you can add upcoming technology. So, uh, in other words, instead of, let me just go back here, instead of when you buy, purchase a new uh, piece of electronics to control your blinds or to control the audio level or whatever, uh, instead of getting a new app and a new user interface for it, OpenHab will allow you to use your known interface uh, to attach that piece of hardware as long as there is one of these so-called bindings. Very, very, very important to my mind. I mean, we all love internet and everything, but uh, it, OpenHab does not rely on the cloud. We can create home automation in a completely isolated environment which does not, I repeat, not require an internet connection. This does not mean that you cannot run OpenHab over the internet. Of course you can. There are people who wish to be able to control their lights from a mobile device when they are um, en route somewhere, when they are uh, outside. I personally have never quite understood why, but there are people who want that. OpenHab will allow us to do that, but it does not rely on any um, internet service. It's open source, so no fees, um, and has a very, very large and active community. So if you have a piece of hardware, a piece of equipment, um, be it a sensor, be it an actuator, in other words, a controller, and you need uh, support for that, it is very likely that in the OpenHab community you'll find somebody who uh, will at least assist you in getting the code. And you can run it basically on any platform that supports Java. Uh, OpenHab is a, is a uh, Java program. Uh, now, if you've known me for a while, you know that every time I hear Java, I get a shiver somehow. But OpenHab is really something that, that typically works. And uh, OpenHab is uh, usable, very usable, on small hardware. So a Raspberry Pi, preferably Model 2, this is a Model 3 here, um, is more than uh, fast enough to run, maybe to control maybe 200 or 300 devices. If you have any questions in between them, please don't hesitate to, to ask. So OpenHab, basically what we have is OpenHab in the middle, in the center here. I have the feeling that the tone goes away. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, and we have our configurations. So basically just text files. Um, and on the other side, we have hardware or software components Excuse me, please. Hardware software components, which OpenHab will then control, which it will run. Now, when you get into the area of home automation, um, <laughs> it's incredible the kind of language you'll find. Uh, this, if I recall correctly, is an exact copy paste from a website uh, which uh, was supposed to give a beginner um, some help into choosing a particular. Uh, yeah, so. 
I still don't understand it. Um, home automation means you get to choose uh, and you get to obtain really quality software, quality hardware components made by people who really know what they do, um, what they're doing. And now, whether you believe it or not, this is made in Germany. This is a screenshot that I took personally of the Homatic uh, control application. Now, Homatic is a German product. This should be an umlaut. Yeah? That's the kind of quality you get. Okay? And OpenHab is going to try and very successfully does, in most cases, completely um, abstract your way away from, from all of this. So let's look a little bit deeper into OpenHab itself, the architecture of OpenHab. We have at the bottom the so-called core components, and then we have bindings. And these bindings are basically the connection between OpenHab and a particular piece of hardware or a particular piece of software. We have configuration in the form of items. And these items, it's also a text file which defines items, these items define a particular um, instance of a particular piece of hardware or a particular piece of software. So, for example, we might have a binding which connects to a homatic light switch. That's the hardware. And on the other hand, we have an item, a switch item, which defines what a switch looks like and its, uh, its attributes. And this switch item, that is what we will then put on a web display, that is what we will then put on a smartphone to be able to actually switch that particular piece of hardware. Now, a binding is not only a connection to hardware, it can just as well be a connection to software. For example, to an MQTT broker. MQTT is a pub -sub publish subscribe protocol, which I'll be using here a lot. And it's absolutely grand. Um, uh, and a binding could also be, for example, a connection to a Fritzbox, which is a, a router telephone system, very popular in Germany. I think also in Holland, no? Yeah. Um, a binding could also be a connection to an um, HTTP request to obtain weather from Yahoo or from some other service, or to post HTTP, post some data somewhere. Okay? And on the other side, we have uh, some logic optionally, uh, but of course that is what makes OpenHab really powerful. And this logic defines rules um, how particular items should uh, interact with each other. So for example, there could be a rule that specifies if we switch on a lamp, then switch off the television set. Yeah? There could be another rule which says if the time is midnight, then switch off the lamp. Okay, so there's, there's a quite powerful uh, language which is easy to learn. It doesn't look like Java. Well, it looks a little bit like Java or like C or like Perl or whatever. Some, some text with a lot of braces. Um, I'm sure you'll get fine. So this is the general architecture of OpenHab. And so what time do I have? Ooh, right. So OpenHab has a whole boatload of bindings. And these bindings, remember, are connections to hardware, to software, etc. So we have all sorts of things like asterisk, for example. We have projectors, Bluetooth, uh, free switch, the, the, also the, the, uh, the VoIP telephony system. We have Homatic, HTTP, MQTT, serial connections for do-it-yourself. Yeah, you've got some do-it-yourself bit of hardware that has a serial connection. You can probably, most probably, control it via OpenHab and the serial connection. I've just highlighted a few of them here, some of which I'm going to talk about. Um, TCP or UDP connectors, you have some piece of legacy hardware which needs a UDP on port, whatever. You can connect it to OpenHab because OpenHab is able to send out or receive UDP data grants. Um, for us Unix people, SNMP it will probably be interesting for you. Z-Wave based, um, um, Z -wave -based uh, hardware uh, bits, which are really, really nice. Uh, also to here, our Wemo switch from earlier. Yeah, there's a Belkin Wemo connector. Okay? So if you have Wemos, 
uh, you can use them with OpenHive. You throw away the, literally throw away the, the, the Belkin app for your iPhone, Android, whatever, and you connect them via OpenHive. And there's an ever increasing, this is just, uh, I think this list I took uh, last year, and it's only sort of uh, selection. Uh, there's an ever increasing number of bindings for, um, for OpenHive. Um, I mentioned earlier that OpenHab uh, configuration items, the logic rules, etc., and what is called a sitemap, is defined in text files. Now, that is more than fine, yeah. But if you like, there's also an additional component called the, the OpenHab Designer, which uh, does a little bit of syntax check and, and uh, coloring and so on and so forth. I personally am not particularly fond of it, but if if you want to use it, then you certainly can. But any text editor is more than fine, uh, which has the advantage, since they are text files, we can keep this configuration in a Git repository, send it by email, whatever, yeah? the, the, usual, the usual thing. So we have items, item configuration. Here's an example of an item. Um, an item has a particular type. This is a switch. This will be a number which will be displayed. A switch is something that actually actuates, which, which we can flick on off, typically. There are color pickers and sliders and things like that as well. The switch gets a, a name and a description. And this name we will use internally in our rules to actually then trigger the switch. And this um, label is what we will see on a user interface. And the switch or any item is connected to a binding, and this is the address of this binding. This is something you don't learn by heart, you check, it, uh, check the documentation. And maybe compare this, this line with this line. This is also a binding. This is the HTTP binding, whereas this is the homatic binding. The homatic binding requires an address and a channel number, and this address is hard coded into the individual homatic appliance. Yes? I, I'm sorry, I have to come closer. I'm a bit hard of hearing. The, the number is something that we will probably use for displaying. Uh, the the uh, number is, is like text. There's also text, but a, a number is something that will be converted into an integer or a float, depending on, on the... Uh, have I answered your question? Um, I'm not quite sure if I understood you. Items are not only devices. That is correct. Uh, items can exist without even displaying them on a user interface. Okay? We might require an item, like something that we obtain from HTTP, some connection that we want. We might require an item, a piece of information, which we will use in a rule, but we will never display it actually on the, on the, on the user interface. And these items, remember please, uh, our switch here was called pplug. These items are then displayed on a user interface, and this user interface is called a sitemap. And an, a single OpenHab instance can carry as many sitemaps as you want. Um, for example, in a home, you might have a sitemap for yourself, which lists all the individual switches and items, etc. And you might have one for your family members who are not really interested in all the little gory details. They don't want to know how many kilowatts per hour your heating is currently consuming. They are just interested in switching on the TV and switching off the kitchen lamp. Yeah? So you would create a sitemap for them with just these two switches on them or items on them, excuse me. <coughs> Whereas you for yourself would have a, um, a sitemap which, uh, which is much more complicated. And the simple definition of this sitemap produces in the web interface exactly this. So we have the, the label, recall from, let me just go back, from earlier, that's the label we have here. We have the label. This thing gets a little icon, a light bulb, which by the way, goes yellow when it's on. Um, it has a switch. Um, and this, this switch item is in a frame, and this is the frame. Okay. And this whole sitemap has a name, and that is the label of the sitemap up here. 
And this, this sitemap uh, name here, JPDemo, uh, is what we will use to actually select the site. Yeah, this is a sitemap with a few more little bits and pieces on it. We have, for example, a power socket. I'll be showing you this live in a moment. The power socket which is currently on. We have a window which is off. We have a temperature value and some, uh, some other things. Now, I think this is, uh, just give me a second. Yeah. I think this suffices for the second. Now, here is this sitemap. I think it's going to slightly modify. Here is the sitemap. And um, I will show you this sitemap on an Android phone. It's exactly the same. Of course, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll come closer. It, it looks a bit different. Also on iOS, it will look a bit different because they, they attempt to model the user interface things to the actual operating system. We can also choose it, I think, light or dark background, etc. Uh, the light background gives us a horrible orange. Um, but these items are exactly what you see there on the, on the, um, on the interface. Thing. Did you see something? I hope you saw two things. First of all, this fantastic bright light on the desk went on, and the power socket moved in the, in the uh, web interface from off to on. Okay? I can do that again. If I hit it properly. They're a bit small for my fat finger. Um, so we see interaction. This app um, talks to Open App, says, this switch, please flick it on. OpenHab does something, talks to the binding. In this case, it sends off a packet to the Hometic appliance. You can come up here later and, and, and look at this. To the Hometic thing, the Hometic thing says, oh, light number LE0Q, whatever, please on. And not only that, but we have here this Hometic, these Hometic appliances, they also, they don't just switch it on, they also report the state. I am now on. And this information, I am now on, is transferred back into OpenHab, and OpenHab then can, with this information, LAMP has switched state to on, do something. And at the very least, it'll, of course, um, update the, the interfaces that are currently listening to. So what else do I have here? I have a, I have a window. I didn't feel like bringing whole windows. I just brought the, the opener, OK? Uh, so the window is now open. Look at the icon on the left. Yeah, window is open. And window is closed. Window is open. This is also a homematic device connected to the homematic controller. Okay. I also have a temperature sensor. Now, it's very, very difficult in a room like this to change the temperature from whatever it is here, 12 degrees to 25, um, without causing tremendous damage. So. I have a little Arduino microcontroller which has a potentiometer. And this little Arduino microcontroller with this potentiometer um, transmits via MQTT to OpenHab. Do you see the, the number changing at the bottom here? Now, the temperature has risen to 25 degrees and of course gets very hot, so we switch on the fan. Okay? And the temperature constantly rises and there comes a moment where it gets so hot that we have to party. So, music. Can you hear it? Turn up the volume. <laughs> now, of course, it's all very fine and good. We have loud music, we can party, we don't have to work anymore. But if somebody goes, no, 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 no. Thank you. Um, never touch my hardware. <laughs> it's bad enough when I touch it. Um, so we have this loud music going, none of us are working, and then Jos goes to the window and opens the window. But that would, of course, disturb the neighbors, right? So when the window opens, we switch off the music. Right? This is home automation. Okay. Um, this is home automation because no app was damaged in doing this. Yeah? Um, nobody used an app 
we have little bits of hardware, little bits of equipment, little bits of software, which interact with each other and which know what to do. Now, I will admit that getting it to do what you want to do can take some time. When I did this demo earlier this year for load in, uh, this is just my second time now, uh, for load days in, uh, where were we? in Antwerp, thank you, um, I showed this to my, to my daughter and showed her, it's really cool that the, when the window opens, the music goes off. And she said, yeah, but what happens if you close the window again? I said, well, nothing. And she said, that's stupid. If you close the window, the music should go on again. So compliments of her, the music goes on again. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, what do you prefer, me or the music? Uh, you can choose them. Um, so, um, what else do we have? We have, for example, uh, can you see this on the right? Yeah, more or less. We um, I think, I'm not quite sure, I forgot. I think this value here, is a number, a number item. And um, behind it is an HTTP request. So what, what I can do, if I find it, yeah. what I can do is echo uh, 23, and a second later, that number changes. Why am I doing this? Why am I showing you this? I mean, nobody would do that to control something. But I'm showing you because we are all Unix, Linux people, uh, so that's the kind of thing we can work with. Okay? Now, what happens there? What actually happens there is that OpenHab, every, I think, 6,000 milliseconds, is doing an HTTP uh, GET request on a particular file. And the fact that I changed that uh, file um, reflects itself in a switch, in a, in a number value there on the top left, uh, cool, cool stuff. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the kind of thing that we can do. We can, we can um, execute programs. If you have, um, if the light goes on, you can launch an, uh, an executable. You can open a pipe to somewhere. No, those, that's the kind of interesting things for us people who do, who do a lot of uh, Unix. Um, what else I'll show you? Yeah, I can, for example, I can publish I can publish via MQTT to a particular topic the topic is there on the right uh, HAB is the topic I publish a uh, payload called hello in a and we see that reflected automatically we have a, an item a text item on the, on our sitemap, and this text item does a subscribe to an MQTT, and immediately, without any delay whatsoever, that showed up here. Okay. Similarly, we can we can subscribe to uh, MQTT on that particular topic on the wildcard. Sorry, sorry, those are escape sequences from my laser pointer. And if I flick. I think it's this switch, we should see something happening. Yeah, so the fact that I switch it on or off will send a zero or a yeah or whatever, yeah? depending on what information I need, okay? So this trivial sitemap with just basically four bindings, we have the, the switch, we have the window, um, and I, I hope I pointed out that these little icons on the left, they move. You know? So if we close the window again, if I can. Yeah, the icons change, okay? So that's very, you can also, of course, add your own icons and so on. Um, right. Any questions so far to this? Yes, please. Oh, version 2.0 is, I think, called um, Eclipse Smart Home. It's basically a large bit of rewrite of the whole core. 
Um, my understanding is uh, that, at least at currently, it is not worth your while to to actually use it productively. If you're willing to contribute, if you're willing to test and do things like that, then yes. But otherwise, there is no reason whatsoever uh, to use it. So current is, I think, 1.8 or 1.7 or 1. Point, uh, I honestly don't know. 1. Point something. Um, I still use productively at home. Uh, 1.5, I think. I see no reason to upgrade. I'm very conservative. Uh, I've reached an age where when things work, you know, you live in... There's no reason for me to upgrade because um, the, the, the relatively little bit that we do with home automation uh, at home um, works fine with whatever we have, so why should I touch it? Um, Oh, it could, could be fun. Uh, anyway, um, well, you give permissions in as much as, well, there, there, there are two ways of doing it. Uh, method number one is you create a sitemap with just the children's bedroom uh, lights and um, set up their page, their smartphone, their whatever, with just that sitemap and hope that they won't find your other sitemaps. Um, so that would be possibility number one. Possibility number two is you could, of course, put OpenHab, it's just HTTP that's happening here, huh? you could put OpenHab behind um, an HTTP proxy, an Nginx or an Apache or something, and, and give permissions for that. Other than that, to my knowledge, it is not yet possible to actually assign permissions to particular sitemaps, or let alone to particular items. I, I honestly don't know if that's on a roadmap or something. Okay? Since there are so many, since we just talk HTTP here, there's so many methods, there's so many mechanisms on how we can protect ourselves behind the proxy, behind the, not a proxy, behind the, what's the word I'm looking for? Behind an HTTP proxy that uh, it's not really worth in, uh, uh, wasting effort to put it into open hat prop. Okay. Yeah, 10 minutes, oh, okay. Uh, so I showed you the mobile interface. Right, what else do we have? Uh, OpenHab can fully be controlled via REST, via REST interface. Uh, so these are some examples here as a GET. That is, of course, is completely idiotic, but I put it there. I mean, it's superfluous, huh? GET is default. I put it there to just to illustrate. Um, so what's the status of our P plug? And we get a link to the actual item, we get the name, we get the uh, state, and we get the type. What is it? So if you have a different interface, you don't, you don't want, you don't want uh, this interface. You prefer to create your own web-based interface. Maybe it looks nicer and so on. There are also alternatives. You can do so. Uh, OpenMap is fully controllable via REST interface. You can toggle a particular switch. Toggle means turn it on if it's off and turn it off if it's on. Uh, you can also set a particular value with a post. Yeah? Here we're setting on to that particular switch. So we can do this via curl, via wget, via jQuery, via any, um, yeah, anything that speaks uh, HTTP. And um, OpenHab does JSON if we ask for JSON, and I think it does, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure. I think it does XML if we ask for XML. But who would ask for XML? Um, so the question that we often, or I often get is, can open? And yes, the answer is yes, it can. Um, or typically can, anyway. Uh, OpenHab can do automation with scripts, with rules, with actions. We have a whole bunch of integrations. Uh, for example, with Google Calendar. I'm not sure that I would use it. In fact, I don't use it because that would make me dependent on a foreign service. And I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not the type to like that. But if you want, uh, OpenHab will integrate with your Google Calendar. And integrate means you would then get an item which specifies, um, for example, days away, hours away, hours available, etc. And you could use this in your own scripts and actions and rules to do something. Um, OpenHab integrates with media players. My friend Ben Jones from New Zealand, for example, he, 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 he adore, he lives, or he breathes OpenHab. Um, he watches um, a film uh, with his wife every evening. And they use XBMC. They don't have a television set. They have XBMC, uh, the, the, the media player. No? 
And when he presses pause on his uh, remote control to pause the film, to go do quickly or get a coffee or whatever, um, the, the lights uh, turn up in the living room. Yeah? When he presses play, the lights dim. When he puts his phone, his smartphone, at the night table in the evenings, um, um, what happens then? When he puts the phone on his night table in the evening, because he's going to sleep, the doors lock. Yeah? And windows close, the alarm is uh, activated. So all that with open hand. Okay. We have user interfaces for web, for as we showed you, for Android, uh, for iOS. They might not be as sexy as Mr. or Mrs. Belkin's uh, interface, correct, but they work everywhere. Okay. So this could certainly look nicer, yes, obviously, but we have to find some sort of a some sort of a middle line between flexibility that OpenHAP gives us with our sitemaps and the actual user interface. Uh, what else do we have? We have console, of course, we have REST API, we have actions, you can send mail, you can speak Jabber, you can do Prowl, you can, with MQTT and MQTT Warn, for example, you can send uh, information out, warnings out to, I think at the moment we have 40, 45 services. Um, there's persistence in uh, DBO, in RRD, in logging. Uh, persistence allows us, for example, this is a screenshot of our house, I think. Yes. Um, the colors are awful, but we, I don't think we can control those at the moment. Um, I, um, I just, as a matter of curiosity, uh, determine how much uh, power is consumed in the house. We have a little, uh, this little uh, U-less thing, which is uh, actually made in Holland. Um, and um, this data is uh, consumed every, I think, five seconds, and is stored in persistence in, uh, I believe, RRD. And the, if we put an appropriate item on our sitemap, then the sitemap will actually display these, these graphs. Yes? Uh, I can tell you a little bit about RRD. Um, can I? RRD was created by... Um, a Swiss chap called Tobias Oetiker and is a very popular mechanism by which in the Unix world statistics, CPU, power, uh, memory consumption, help me please somebody, all sorts of statistics can be uh, saved because they are saved in different granularities. You specify, for example, for the first, for 24 hours I would like um, minute-wise readings in, in the first week, I, it's enough if I have daily readings, and for the rest of the year, it's sufficient if I have weekly readings. And RRD databases, which are files in particular format, don't grow. So they, you can pump data in for um, a thousand years, and they will never grow. Okay. Uh, DB4O, I cannot explain to you. DB4O is a Java adapter to um, a SQL light storage in Java. Also some big blob of a file. Um, there are though in persistence, you can also put in the back, you can put in my SQL database, you can put a PostgreSQL database. Uh, I think there's also Mongo now if you absolutely must. Uh, if you're not so interested in the data, then Mongo is good. Um, uh, InfluxDB, that is very interesting. InfluxDB is a time series database, very, very performant. It's a single database, a single uh, executable written in Go. Speak faster. Uh, it's a single executable written in Go and uh, it's used in particular for time series uh, things. We can do transformations with JSON, with XSLT, so there's, there's really a lot of um, possibilities. I think I already mentioned for us Unix people, um, execute programs, open pipes, read from pipes, send to pipes. Uh, there's so much stuff we can use to play, it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, so ideas, we've already mentioned a few, lights on after dark, uh, put, point the webcam at the window um, on open, a very interesting uh, an acquaintance has a webcam in the front of his, in, basically at, in the hallway in the entrance, and he has two daughters, and uh, his daughter said, say, said, if that webcam ever films us, you're in trouble, okay? Which is which is good. I find that is a very good thing. So he uses OpenMap. That camera is pointed normally at the window 
or at the ceiling or something. When they leave the house, when open hat says there's nobody here because of presence detection, for example, with own tracks, mm -hmm, camera goes back. Yeah? That's the kind of thing you can very easily do with uh, open hat. Mute the music when phone rings. If you have Sonos, for example, do you know Sonos? Sonos, uh, there's a binding for Sonos. Um, phone rings, um, music is muted. Switch the iron off when leaving home. I need that for my loved one. Um, start the irrigation at night. Uh, night time comes, water get, might get cheaper in your area, start irrigating in the garden. But of course, only in the summertime. If it's pouring cats and dogs, we don't need to irrigate. Uh, switch the coffee machine on when the alarm clock rings, etc., etc., etc. Warn off open windows when you leave the house. Yeah? Things like that. So these were just a few examples and ideas of what you can do with OpenHab. And uh, yeah, this is Ben Jones. He, uh, he has a, a pretty large OpenHab installation with umpteen uh, sensors and actuators. So if you're interested, if I've uh, convinced you to at least have a look, and I believe you should have a look if you're interested in home automation, it's worth visiting openhat.org. They have uh, quite good documentation, very large wiki, individual uh, videos. And as I say, there's a, a very large community which is typically very helpful in answering questions. 10 seconds. Any very short questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, there's a difference. Uh, I can't tell you the difference because I don't know a lot of the competing programs. Um, there is also a, a, something written in Perl, which in Germany I understand is quite um, popular, F FHEM or something like that. They are all sort of do-it-yourself uh, things that started up. I, th I, I honestly I, I cannot answer your question. The only thing I can say about OpenHab is it is, uh, it is popular because of its stability, of its, of its community, and of its uh, tremendous amount of binding. So, that's all I can say. I, I cannot. I cannot compare. I'm sorry. One more question. No questions. No more questions. Okay. Coffee time. Thank okay, you very much thank for you. listening. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. That's, oh, lovely. Thank you.